<laughs> so we used to say that your schools have to be and then we have to talk to two principals because that's for sure. That's for sure. It's all author discussion. Yeah. Who's that? Find my three brown holes. Or maybe not. For some people, it is. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and I will be calling our first meeting of our 2022 budget uh, to order. We have Ms. Klamosko joining us uh, via telephone this morning. Ms. Klamosko, you can hear us fine. Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and for the record, uh, Councillor Scobie uh, may be joining us a little bit later. He has uh, gone for a rapid COVID test. Um, and hopefully it will be negative and he'll be joining us in a few minutes. So with that, um, just a couple of remarks uh, from council. Thank you to all of those who are joining us live stream. Um, and just a couple of uh, points about our budget. Our budget uh, in Leduc County is fairly iterative, which means that we have an opportunity uh, to look at small parts of it during the year from different departments, uh, be it through public works or other committees, which allows us to take a look at small pieces and have had opportunity to have those discussions. So uh, today uh, we'll probably be having some fairly high level questions. We have a process where if the questions cannot be answered by our administration, they're brought back to our next budget meeting to ensure that council has all of the information that they need to make the decisions we need to have for the budget. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Coleman for opening remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of council. So it's our pleasure to uh, present uh, the 2022 interim budget to you. Uh, this budget still reflects uh, the current economic conditions we're in and facing. Uh, COVID has not left us, as you can see today, we are, we're dealing with it through uh, technology. We have Renee we're remoting in uh, and uh, hopefully during 2022 we'll lapse out of COVID and start moving <coughs> towards recovery and a turn in the economy we believe. Uh, so really we see the 2022 budget as kind of the final piece of, of getting us back on track uh, going forward over the next number of years. Uh, it is a conservative budget, uh, but is it a, it's a budget that reflects, I think, the needs of the county uh, as envisioned by administration. Uh, our task was to put together a budget. We've done that. Uh, we present it to you. Uh, now it's council's uh, role to obviously work through the budget and decide what's best for the residents of the county. Uh, as I've always said during budget deliberations, we will move as fast as each councillor requires us to move. So if you have questions, you need detail, um, you need clarification, you need answers, don't hesitate. It is your process now. We have delivered a budget to you. It is now yours to make it yours. And uh, we are here to support that in any way we can. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Renee to lead us through. Thank you. All right. Good morning. So the first item on the agenda is tab number two, which is budget five. Um, just hang on, uh, Ms. Klamosko, you're breaking up a little bit. Um, we're going to do some IT voodoo if we can here. Uh, just hold on for a minute, and when I get an okay from Kent, we'll get you to start again. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Renee, we're going to try and call you on your landline. Uh, can you text uh, Michelle your landline number, please? Yeah. 
that might hang it on the fence, but it depends, it depends on who put it. Hello? 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 Okay. Can you hear me? Oh, much better. Yeah, much better, Renee. And okay. you can, if you can just uh, start again, that would be great. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. So our first item on the agenda is under tab number two, and that is budget guidelines. So going through the budget guidelines, back in June of 2021, Council approved the guidelines that you have within your binder. So a couple of highlights for changes that I wanted to mention were that we changed the long-range plan to be a 10-year plan in lieu of a five-year plan. The interim budget guideline also assumed a 2% tax dollar budget increase over 2021. We have a minimum amount of $5.5 million in tax dollars to fund the major project and capital project plan. And then we also approved the use of up to $2 million from the stabilization reserve. So at that time, we had discussed, um, we had an environmental scan report that went to council at that time. And we were anticipating assessment decreases for the 2022 tax year. And that is why we had to ask for the potential utilization of stabilization reserve. So that summarizes the guidelines that were set back in June. Are there any questions about the guidelines from council? Uh, we do have a question from uh, Councillor Vandenberg. Whenever you're ready, Councillor Vandenberg. Uh, good morning, Renee. <clears throat> On the uh, long-range financial plan, going from five years to ten years, what is uh, the confidence markers that you have to be able to uh, project to ten years? Um, can you speak to that? What 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 allows you to be able to project pro project ten years as opposed to five? Well, I do think that it is a work in progress that, you know, typically we have focused more in the five-year window. So the movement to a 10-year is really um, expanding the work that we're doing to really look in the longer term. So I, I definitely see that as we move forward, we will improve upon our long-range projections as we do this every year that you'll see in some of the long range when we go to that section of the um, binder that you'll see on the major project you see a decrease after that number five years into the future so it, it is our first attempt at a longer range plan that i do think we can spend more time refining it and improving over time Okay, so I'd be prepared to chat about this further. I'm just worried that your effort is for naught um, in an uncertain economy. And uh, all it is is throwing darts at a dartboard, I think. So I'm very interested to hear what your, your rationale is uh, later on. Thank you. And, uh, thank you, Councillor Vandenberg. Welcome, uh, Councillor Scobie. Glad that you're healthy and with us right now. Are you healthy? I am. I'm good. <laughs> That's their opinion. Okay. <laughs> yeah, All right. I see no other hands on uh, the guidelines. So moving on, Ms. Klamosko. <clears throat> okay. So the next item on the agenda is an overview of the budget package. So just going through, the binder is similar to what council has received in the past. We have um, an overview to start this morning with the high-level documents. And then as we proceed through the deliberation days, we will get into more detail at the department level. So in the agenda, we've estimated the time required to speak to the various items. So the one item that we've noted on the bottom of the agenda is that the agenda is subject to change dependent on the budget discussions of that day in order so we can maximize use of time um, throughout our budget deliberation days. One item you mentioned there was around any questions that get asked that we cannot answer. We'll capture those questions and we have time at the start of every day to bring back information um, from the previous day to answer questions that council may have. Also, one item note is 
items that council would like to discuss further later on in the budget deliberation phase, we will make note of on our adjustment summary and allow for that discussion to occur uh, later in the budget deliberations as well. Any questions on that process? <coughs> I'm seeing no hands, and again, because we are fortunate to have all of our council return uh, from the election, we are very familiar with the process and uh, do appreciate the uh, work that administration does to answer our questions. So continue on, Ms. Kamasko. Okay, thank you. So the next item on the agenda is under tab four. So these are the consolidated budget documents. So at the highest level, oh, I'm sorry, I have bypassed assessment projections. I, I apologize. I will pass it over to Ms. Renan to provide the assessment projection. Thank you very much. I was just going to do that. Go ahead, Ms. Renan. Good morning. Thank you, Mayor DeBlanco, <laughs> Council, Administration. Um, so I will start. Uh, my discussion with you this morning saying that these are projections um, and final numbers will will not be complete until um, I hope my numbers will be closer to complete by the end of January, but uh, the provincial assessor will not have everything complete um, until the end of February. So that's when we will truly have all of our final numbers. Looking at things and, and contemplating that for the assessment year, it would be a full year of COVID impact, where last year we were looking at the way the uh, assessment year cycle is, is that it wasn't a full COVID year impact. So that will have a bearing on the airport. And we are in preliminary discussions with the airport on um, what their numbers or their travel counts are looking like and parking and all of those kinds of things. Um, have to say pleasantly that I was there recently and International Departures area is open, but uh, like to two flights a day uh, and not every day. So that is still um, an issue and many of the retail stores and that kind of thing are, are not open there. As well, um, some issues with Aurora Cannabis that uh, we will have to contemplate in, in terms of some of the changes that are happening there and their transition as well. So residential sales, we had 163 improved residential sales and 69 vacant residential sales. And my assessment to sales ratio, so what my current assessment is compared to the overall sales is running about 97%. So there is a, a little room for assessment change and uh, inflation there. So that will, that will likely happen. Um, fairly flat, you know, 97% still falls within the range, uh, but seeing some definite growth of, around the recreational like properties. And under non-residential, we had eight vacant sales and 15 improved. Assessment to sales ratio there is running about 100%. So I don't have very much room to, to move for our non-res. Overall, last year, when all the final numbers and assessment changes and revisions were made, we came in at about $8.463 billion. My projections, again, projections are at $8.59 billion. So that is an overall assessment change in an upward direction of 1.5%. So, um, better than anticipated, um, most of the, the growth would be around machinery and equipment, um, about 2% there, 
non-residential about one and a half. So a little bit of growth of the finishing of some of the projects that were going on in uh, North Nisku. Uh, not a, a whole bunch. There's been some modifiers as well on um, cost to construct because obviously cost to construct has gone up. Overall with the dip, seeing about a 0.66% increase there. That is very rough calculation due to those numbers are in the control of the province. And I can't physically figure out what all the depreciation factors will be on, on each of the those things. And then I'm anticipating about 1.9% uh, increase overall in residential. Um, I can show you this. Natasha, if you don't mind, these are the base year modifiers that came from the province. So these are the changes for the linear wells, pipelines, electric power, telecommunications. Of course, farmland not changing at all. So wells, the base year modifier was an increase of 2.7, pipelines, zero. Um, 0.93 for electric power, telecommunications and cable, 5.61, machinery and equipment, two and a half, and then railway property, 14.83. So those factors are applied and that will, um, will give us some, some inflationary changes. These factors are due to cost co to construct primarily. So it is interesting that if your material is going downward on wells, that is 2.7. But if your material is to go horizontal, that's zero. But they're not my numbers. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, that gives you a, a rough idea. So these numbers, these uh, rough projections that administration has utilized to uh, draft the budget. And that is where we sit right now. Um, thank you very much. And I will open the floor for any questions on the assessment, preliminary assessment numbers. Councillor Manenberg. So we're on tab five now, right? You're just presenting uh, in tab through tab five? No. Are we still on tab no. four? No. Sorry, through the chair, this is not in your binder. Right. The assessment projections are okay. separate. So. so we're still in a conversation around consolidated budget tab four. Is that correct? We, we are no. on number no. three. You're in number three. Yeah. We're there was a little bit of assessment projects. Yeah. No yes. problem. We backed up a little bit. <clears throat> no problem. Ms. Bernand, I mean, despite the fact that, I mean, we've had a very rough year with COVID, we know that oil and energy prices were up and down or coming back. <clears throat> is what I, I'm thinking 1.5 is fairly positive considering the climate. Any thoughts on that? I mean, yes, I, I feel it's, it's positive. Um, any any upward trend yes. is, is <laughs> positive, um, and considering all of the the impacts that we have to um, adjust for as we're hopefully um, pulling out of of the the COVID impact, that percent and a half is is really quite yeah quite positive. Yeah, and and again, thanks thanks to our council for ensuring that we do have a low uh, non-risk tax rate, that we're able to do the permitting and things. I think that that still is one of our um, abilities to draw new businesses in, and we certainly saw that last year. Um, unfortunately, we don't know what inflation is going to look like going forward and how that might affect any kind of further investment in the non-res area. I, I, that's quite a consideration, certainly. Uh, Edmonton Global talked about that, about the city of Edmonton and projects that they have on the go and what that's going to do for them. But I'm thinking 1.5 is a cautiously optimistic number and will help us 
through our budget deliberations. Thank you, Councillor Vandenberg. So coming out of the convention, uh, pretty strong, positive uh, economic uh, forecast. Um, the ex expect uh, the, the uh, oil and gas uh, sector is, is, is up and running and will surge. Um, the hydrogen uh, conversation is uh, very positive uh, investment. So long as Ottawa just stays put, uh, investment uh, into the western of Canada is, uh, is uh, highly sought after. Uh, you have some issues with the oil in the U.S. Uh, versus uh, Russian and, uh, and Middle East oil, uh, which makes uh, Alberta very uh, positive. Um, so lots of optimism throughout, um, uh, especially when Kenny got up and spoke, but certainly you heard that from all the ministers um, and through the rest of the group. So uh, we're can essentially Alberta is leading the pack in Canada for economic growth currently, and we'll continue to do that. So, yeah, I, I think um, when some supply chain issues resolve themselves, that is another issue of projects getting finished, right? So we probably have a lot more um, progressive work than I, yes, yes than would on. be normal that they're, they're waiting on product. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I'm not seeing any further hands. So thank you for that information. Um, and we'll move on to, I guess, number five, which is budget overview. And the first one is tab four, consolidated budget. Is that correct? That is correct. So right. Mrs. Klamosko had already gone over the yes. overview of the budget package. So we'll move on to tab four under the consolidated budget. Tab four, everyone. And whenever you're ready, Ms. Klamosko. Okay, so the first document under tab four is the consolidated budget for interim. So we have our revenues and expenses identified for our operating and capital funds. So overall, our total revenue, we have 88, just over 8 million for operating fund revenue, and just under 23 million capital fund revenues for 2022. On the expense, expenditure side, we have operating fund expenses of just over 85 million, and capital fund expenses of just below 26 million. For total revenues and expenses of 111 million, are there any questions on this summary? Okay, questions at equal zero, which it has to, so looking good so far. Moving on to tab. So we'll continue just to the next okay. page within tab four. So we just provide uh, more detail in terms of the operating fund budget. So what you'll see here, are, uh, it's a high level summary of all of the revenues and expenditures for every department. And then you can see how both tie into the summary that we just presented. And then the very, uh, when you last follow, speaks to our tax dollars that are used within the various departments. And then that far right column that says zero just shows that that is a funded budget that we've utilized over our So as we go through the department presentations throughout the next few days, all of these tied into this summary. So are there any questions on any of the information on this page? Okay. Just, just to clarify, Ms. Klamosko, so in the far right column where it has budget surplus or deficit those surplus and deficits will be talked about while we look when we look through things more specifically is that correct yes so if there's any questions we'll ask them when we're in the detailed piece uh, what this shows is that we have a balanced budget that's right it, that last column just speaks to tax yep. dollar funded okay. um, that anything that has um, a negative number is is showing that we're going to be utilizing uh, tax dollars to fund okay that expenditure. Thank you, Councillor Vandenberg. Anything that has a negative dollar shows it needs tax dollars? Correct. Okay, so I'm a little bit confused on the operating fund budget. <clears throat> I always thought that the total of uh, expenses, which is 88.9, drives the revenues of 88.9. So whatever the expenses are is what your revenues need to be. 
Is that not correct? So we have, because we have the two types of revenues, we balance the budget as a whole use in the operating fund and the cap fund. There are some things that where we transfer revenues over the cap fund balance or fund capital projects because we have tax dollar funded capital projects. So it's really two operating funds together balance in order to come to that fully funded budget and that consolidated summary that we went through on that first page. So they need to be looked at um, in the priority, not just as a standalone. So if all of our grants would cover our expenses, then that final one would be zero because we wouldn't need tax dollars. Correct? Um, well, if we went to uh, a municipality that didn't raise tax dollars, right. then we would have a certain one. Right. But ultimately, we have other revenue sources as identified on the left-hand side of the operating fund um, sheet that we have other revenue sources. Correct. All of these revenue sources added together, along with the revenue sources identified on the capital fund, when we have all of those together and the expenses we have identified, we have a balanced budget. Ms. Weiss would like to uh, add some detail. Thanks. Go ahead. Uh, through the chair. So on that budget surplus deficit column, that far right one, the top one is a positive. Those are our tax dollars. Then as you go through, you can see the tax dollars that each specific department is using. So I can't show it all on one screen, but for example, administration and agricultural services are the first ones. And you can see administration is using 8.6 million of tax dollars and agricultural is using 1.3. So essentially, um, it brings that revenue component, the 74 million, uses it all, utilizes it to bring us down to that zero in that far right-hand corner. Now this, the one thing about this particular schedule is it does not only include tax dollars, this also includes your requisitions. Right. So your expenses in, uh, have to equal your revenues. Yes. And yes. That was my question. Yeah. Any further questions on the high-level um, 2022 operating fund budget interim? I have no questions, Ms. Klamasko, move on. Okay, so the next schedule under this tab is your capital fund budget. So again, it outlines the various revenue sources to fund our capital budget. So we have total revenue of the 26.7 million, and then have our expenses. You'll see here there's, when you talk about the deficit, that is equal to amortization, as we do not fund amortization on our capital assets. Okay, got that. Any questions, Councillor Vandenberg? So this is where I need help. Okay, I know that we're going to spend uh, our budget's 100 consolidated 111 million. Okay, of that, we're going to spend on our operating side 88.9. Okay, that leaves us with 22.1, but we still have to spend capital, and I don't see 22.1 in either rev in the expenses side. So I don't get how we're going to spend 43 million on capital, but we only have 22.1 left. So I'm sure that there's a logical explanation of this. So if you go a little bit lower on that summary, so you have those total expenses of 43.3 million, mm -hmm. and then there's those two adjustments that fall below that. So there was a transfer to operating funds. So part of fund accounting is you have to eliminate interfund transfers. We're eliminating $825,000 because that is the transfer to the other schedule that we went through just previously. And then we were used by amortization. So your actual total capital fund expenditures is that $25,875,482. So that is what ties to that consolidated summary of the first we have. 85.1 million operating fund expenses and 25 $0.8 million worth of cap fund expenses. So okay. then that those two expenditure amounts equals 
total revenue of 111 million solar kits. Sorry, but the math still doesn't work. 111 is where we're starting. We got to take out 88.9. We get we end up with 21.2 left, and I don't see a 21.2 anywhere on this page. So, so if we go back to the operating fund schedule, there are some adjustments similar to what's on the capital fund, where you have to eliminate your internal recovery, so as well as your transfers to the capital fund. So when those two things are removed, your actual operating fund expenditures are the 85.1 million, okay. not the 88.9. So those are uh -huh. uh, the two numbers that we make these internal adjustments because of fund accounting and elimination of interfund transfers. So that is why we have a top a summary that and outlines that your operating fund expenses are in fact 85.1 million, not the 88.9. Thank you. Okay. That now works. Now my next question is transfers to capital fund 3.7. And that's part of this uh, formula to balance this out in my mind. Mm -hmm. What what is transfers? What, what is that? What is it? So, three point seven million. Um, so what that is is when we raise revenue in the operating fund, some of that revenue is utilized to fund expenditures in the capital fund. So you have to transfer dollars over to your capital fund. So that is ultimately the transfer from the operating fund to the capital fund. Okay, so 3.7 million transferred from operating to capital, somewhere in here. Uh, Ms. Weiss, there are actually a couple different components hidden that within these cells that are all rolled up to make that 3.7. So a portion of it, some of them are capital projects funded by tax dollars. Some of it is transfers from capital res or operating reserves into the capital budget. So there, there's actually three or four columns. I don't have them with me at the moment, but um, uh, we're using there's, two million of reserves for this budget. Um, we are not using any stabilization reserves. Stabilization operating reserves. That's right. <laughs> okay, so that explains that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Uh, moving on, Ms. Kamasko. Okay. So if there's no questions on the operating or capital fund schedule, we'll move on to the next tab, which is tab five. So on in this tab, we have the municipal tax dollars required for our interim budget. So the proposed municipal tax dollars required is the $74.2 million. Then we show the reduction for the requisition, so the dollars that we collect that we just pass on uh, to the province and the Leduc Regional Housing Foundation, which is 26.7 million. We also reduce the local improvement tax. This is a tax that is um, charged to specific landowners for improvements that were done to their land. And then so the post tax dollars required in this budget is $46,413,377, which is a 1.76% increase over the tax dollar budget 2021. As we mentioned, when we went to the budget guideline, council had given administration's guideline of 2%, so we have come in low percent. Uh, guideline that was approved. Um, thank you. In the past, um, Alberta School Foundation hasn't been um, announced or it gets announced later. Are we using the numbers from 2021 or we actually know what they're, uh, I'm seeing Ms. Weiss is saying, no, it's we're using 2021 numbers? That Are is you? correct. Okay. And it will change and most likely upward. And really, that is why we do a final budget later in the spring is once the province finalizes their budget and we're able to incorporate their final numbers into our final budget. Thank you for that. Any further questions on uh, municipal tax dollars required? Okay. So 1.76 is what this budget, the interim budget reflects. That is correct. 
So going to the next page under tab five is a more detailed summary of the tax dollar requirement by department. So you'll see in the 2022 tax levy is a highlighted column. It just shows tax dollars that are being utilized by that department in the 2022 budget. And that column that will tie in that highlight summary that we just had gone through. Okay. So this information, like I said, is a high level summary of all the department budgets. And as it goes through the department budgets individually, we'll be able to speak to any various that that department has. But this is the funding of those departments and the tax dollars listed about. But okay, so that's a detailed piece on uh, where the tax dollars are going as well as um, from the interim budget. Any questions on that? Councillor Manenberg. So I don't recall if these are about the same from year to year, but I'm on the um, the percentage change called consolidation, the last call. You're right. We're not on that page. Yeah, we are. It's this one here. Yeah, one that's the one we're on. Yeah. yeah, it's the same thing. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that one there. Anyway. What jumps out at me always when I look at these things is the amount of change. So uh, the top one is three point higher, three percent higher than two percent, and then FCSS is almost five percent lower. Kind of curious as to it. Some of them FCSS is minus thirty five percent change. So, so there's conversation around: is there is there some some big news to do with these changes? I guess is what I'm curious about. So I can start with FCSS and why is it a 34% change down? From, can, from can, tax required, Ms. Weiss. Can I just get some clarification? Because the document that we're looking at, FCSS, such 17.15% increase. Oh. Yeah, uh, Mr. Yeah, I, I thought you were on the wrong page, Councillor Vandenberg. Okay. So he's just going to review the page now. Okay. So then same idea, then protective services is almost 20% more. Yes. So, okay. Is there some stories around these ones that just and FCSS is seventeen percent more? Yep. So, absolutely. As we start to go through the individual budget pro programs, which some of them start this afternoon, and then the majority of them are on Wednesday, each department will be able to explain those variances. Good. Thank you. And it might be great to actually pull that page out and set it aside, and then you can make sure that you're actually asking the questions on those. I know with protective services, we did approve a big increase for fire. <laughs> Just another point um, in terms of the tax bill requirement. So there will be changes identified and variances explained within the department, but this, there can also be funding changes. Uh, so we can also, part of the variance on this page can be that we've identified to use more tax dollars in the specific budget than we did in the previous year. So there's the funding component as well. So not, there's those considerations here that this is the funding source, not the expenditure side. Okay, thank you for that. And I have Ms. Weiss, and then if Councillor Vandenberg has a further question on that. So two things affect that. One is the so, funding, other is what we've approved. Yes, so what you see on this particular document, see the final MP and CP, this is the tax dollar component mm -hmm. for our major capital project plan. So if, for example, here, administration in 2021, um, it had 243750 in tax dollars for the MPCP plan. Then in 2022, it had 132500 So there's a change in funding source there, which is also taken into consideration in this 6.14% consolidation change. Okay. So, but that's confusing. Because really, when you're looking at a budget, regardless of where your funding is, is what your mm -hmm. budget conversation needs to be. Mm -hmm. And then after you then add, you factor in more than what is the money coming from. And so, um, so this, sorry. So when we get into talking on these individual levels. Mm -hmm. The detail will be there. Mm -hmm. So it's still confusing because what you're doing is you're factoring in, depending on where the funding is coming from, to influence the change. So this, 
this particular schedule is specific to tax dollar requirements. Right. Only tax dollars. So that's why anything tax dollars is, is taken into consideration on this one. So reserves aren't on here, that type of thing. It's any change in tax dollar requirements. Okay, so, so this, if I want to have a conversation around FCSS, <clears throat> and this document is telling me there's a 17% increase. Mm -hmm. For tax dollars. Okay, that's not necessarily true. The department could be 24%, could be 16%. It depends on the funding. Am I understanding that correct? The tax dollar increase is 17.15%. Okay, so, but that's not the entire conversation. Correct. That's right. You'll get into more of the funding options comes into the detailed packages, but the tax dollar impact is 17.15%. Okay. So tax dollar? Yeah. Okay. Yes. And, and the intent of this morning is at high level and then drilling down during the process. So again, great page to pull out and set aside to make sure that those questions that you have are being answered. Good, thank you. Okay, moving on, Ms. Klamosko, no further questions. Okay, so going to the next tab on the agenda is tab six, and that's the 2022-2025 operating financial plan. <coughs> and Ms. Weiss will be making that presentation. Okay, so as part of the MGA, we are required to do a three-year operating financial plan. So this particular one takes 2022, 23, 24, and 25 into consideration. What we've done is we started at the 2022 proposed interim budget. Then we apply different factors. So in this particular case, we were conservative. We applied a 1% inflation and a 0% growth at this moment in time. So through that, if you... the more what I view to be the most important box on this particular schedule is this bottom where it says total tax dollars available to support the capital plan. This is a pretty good indication of, <clears throat> excuse me, we have 5.514 million in 2022, then we decrease slowly. So without, if we didn't change taxes, we would have less and less tax dollars available for that capital plan or for other things. Um, one thing of note is, Inflation, some of the items in here don't necessarily go up equally. They didn't all go up by 1%. For example, we do know some things that are coming. The police funding model, for example, in 2023 is going up to 1, 1 million and change, which is an increase of 266,000. But then in 2024, there's a hefty jump to 1.6 million which is an increase of 536,000. So some of those items are taken into consideration here. And so it's just a high level summary to show where we're going when we take inflation and growth into consideration. Ms. Weiss, does this, this uh, table then get updated when we do our final budget and then the rolling changes <clears throat> are indicated so that we go out to 2026? We have not historically done okay. that. Okay, just wondering. So this table doesn't really tell, this is for future uh, conversation around the coffee table. Mm -hmm. It does not really have a whole lot of impact on my, my conversation around this 2022 budget coming up, <clears throat> right? This is just, by the way, did you know that? Yeah, this is looking future forward, keeping that long-term, longer term hat on. Thank you. As Welcome. part of a requirement by the MGA. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. I am not seeing any further hands. Ms. Klamosko, moving on. So going to the next item on the agenda, we are going to tab eight, and those are reserve schedules. Tab eight, reserve schedules. So the first schedule in your binder is the operating fund reserve schedule. So we are beginning... Uh, 2022 with a balance of 23.5 million, uh, budgeted to use $924,641 and budgeted to add $394,292 into the operating fund reserve. So the budgeted year and balance is just over that $23 million. Okay. Questions on operating fund, operating fund reserve schedule yeah so i did do a little bit of learning uh, this last week 
what's the difference between restricted and non-restricted reserves? And can the Alberta government grab either of them if they so chose? So typically, I don't know, do you, because you've got the these all earmarked, would that be restricted? I mean, they're intended for one thing. I think that's what restricted so, yeah. means. First question, the difference between restricted and unrestricted reserves. Go ahead, Ms. Weiss. So I can speak from the public sector accounting standards. When you talk about restricted, it's items that can only be used for a certain for a certain thing, for example, offsite levies, mm -hmm. which under our financial statements, we actually move them out of reserves for just that reason, because they're not available for everyday spending. It's not, um, it's not unrestricted, for lack of a better term. Um, whereas anything in our operating fund reserve schedule and our capital reserve schedule, they are set aside for a specific reason, but not regulated specifically. So in the case of offsite levies, we physically accept the funds for a specific purpose such as road upgrades in that particular off-site levy area <clears throat> where on the capital reserves we might put money into a road on the capital side one of the let me get the proper terminology an engineered structure management reserve for roads for anywhere in the county is and that is that considered restricted then because it's in a named uh, category from a PSAB regulation, no. Okay. Second yeah. question, or Ms. So then, Moscow may have more. Whether you deem it restricted or unrestricted, uh, whether you tag it or you don't, <clears throat> the risk is is that the government can come along and, and 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 tap into your reserves, can ask you to send them a check. Is that correct? That's that's Ms. what was coming up in conversation. Okay, Mr. Coleman, that was some of the conversation that's at RMA. Scary. So. Yeah, there's, there's, we are children of the province. Uh, we are developed through the MJ. Um, so there's nothing stopping the province from eliminating municipalities. In essence, then that money would go somewhere. Um, there's never been a history of the province taking reserves away from a municipality. Um, the fear has been, uh, the last number of years especially, is that uh, rural municipalities are seen as having lucrative bank accounts. And that the province looks to that to say, um, what are you doing with that money? And so by having a reserve policy, uh, by using our reserves in a prudent, ma responsible manner, uh, not overtaxing, uh, typically those are the things you do so that the province looks at you and says, you're, you're running in an appropriate manner. Nothing stops the province from eliminating municipalities, which would in essence eliminate your bank accounts. So it doesn't matter what we do, <clears throat> we're still the children of the province. That's correct. Uh, because in a larger context, the conversation around decentralizing linear, for example, has yeah. was thrown around a lot in this conference. And when you do that, then you've got municipalities that are basically going to fold it. And what funds them? Well, it could be some of us yeah. that are not caught in that same. So you, it makes you just wonder. Okay. So that's why I'm bringing up this restricted right. and unrestricted was the terminology is thrown out there. Yeah. I, I think that's why it's so important to have a, a municipal reserve policy Which uh, we have. That, that speaks to how you collect it, why you collect it, what you're doing with that money. And also why we're developing 10 year capital plans, three year operating plans, asset management, all these things that we're doing to show not, not only our residents, but the province and others, that we have a plan. Yeah. We have a plan for money. We collect taxes and we put them aside for these specific purposes and reasons over time uh, that you try to take the humps and valleys out of budgeting, that you create an environment of certainty going forward, not only for your residents, but for the business community uh, to invest and develop in your municipality. Um, so it's, it, as we said earlier, that work is a little bit in its infancy here uh, for us, but we're moving forward and each year uh, our 10-year plan becomes more solid. Our asset management uh, programming is getting better and better to reflect on our budgeting processes. So um, great question. So that's a strategic point uh, for the questions that I had for Renee earlier. Why are you moving from a five to a 10-year? And you're just pointing out the more that you can show you've got your plan act together, plan, the less likely that you'll be uh, up on the radar. Yeah, absolutely. And, and because the only option otherwise is spend all your money every year and then amortize and, and push your debt limit out of, out of the world, right? I mean, yeah. and we know that 
that's more of an urban response to how to deal with budgets as opposed to a rural one. Absolutely. Good. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions on that tab? Seeing none, moving on, Ms. Clamasco. So I will just, if we just flip page two, we'll just go through the capital fund reserve schedule. Yep. So budget at the start of 2022 will be $19.8 million. We are budgeting to use $3,776,786 and plan to contribute to reserve $1,384,482. So the total budgeted balance at the end of 2022 will be just over that $17.5 million. So just one item of note here, we had conversations um, through various budget discussions with council through workshop that capital fund reserves were utilized for specific projects in the capital budget where reserve aligned with the project that was being done. So we have identified these reserves for four specific purposes and we had projects that aligned with those purposes so we have utilized capital fund reserves as a funding source. Questions? Seeing none, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so that concludes the reserve schedule. So the next item on the agenda is the new initiative plan, which is under tab 10. And this has both a summary sheet and a detailed uh, project plan behind it. Yes. Whenever you're ready. So for 2022, we have three new initiatives identified. So the first new initiative was staffing for the Miskew District South Fire Station. So with the move for to a full-time daytime service in Miskew, these are the operating costs impact for that new initiative. So we have staffing and startup costs, which have a total budget impact of $709,788. Okay, and that is broken down on the new initiative sheet. Uh, back page uh, breaks it down. Any questions on that, Councillor Vandenberg? So I still struggle with um, the the FTE is required, and when I do the math, um, I mean, 634,000 is 142,000 per person per year, and this is not a full-time, full-time, 24-7. Um, that's that just seems, and then you're and an additional ask of 75 grand on top of that. Um, I just think that's pretty high, and. Um, and I, I, I don't get why it needs to be so high. So I'm wondering if this is a question for um, the chief to come back and bring some detailed information. Would that be acceptable? Yes, yep. would. Thank you. So what we want from um, the fire chief is um, a detailed breakdown of the cost for the FTE. Um, you're fine with the any questions on the ongoing annual costs that are there? I'm not seeing any questions there. So just on the breakdown, thank you. We will get that to you guys. Thank you. Okay, so the next new initiative on this summary is an asset management program. So <coughs> this ask is to identify some ongoing budget dollars to go towards our asset management program. We formed an asset management committee back in 2018. And these dollars will help us uh, tap into external resources when the fire has moved that asset management work forward, just because there's all various components that we can um, utilize some external assistance. 
Okay, so again, to purchase uh, goods is required and support the continued advancement of asset management practices, $30,000, and this is operating yearly, is that correct? Yes, the ask is to make this an ongoing budget item in the county manager's office budget. Thank you. Questions? Councillor Lewis? Thank you. What is it that you're actually, are you purchasing a program? No. Um, at this point of time, I would say that we have identified a work plan for 2022 with the Act Management Committee. So we have a couple of different initiatives where we could tap into some external professional services to support us in the completion of that work. So we have a state of infrastructure report that we want to to complete as well as a corporate level of service document. So those are just two fairly big initiatives that I think we could benefit from external expertise to help with those. Okay. okay. I, I didn't catch those two programs that you uh, refer to externals, um, external consulting. Just a little bit more detail on those programs, if you could, Ms. Klamasko. Okay, so we have a work plan that the Asset Management Committee is just in the midst of finalizing for 2022. And in our Asset Management Strategy, we identified two core documents that we believe we need uh, to develop. One is a state of infrastructure report, so it's uh, compiling information on all of our various asset classes to see where we are at in terms of uh, their condition, the dollars we need to invest to maintain, re replenish, replace these assets. The second document is ground level service. So asset management, we purchase assets to deliver a level of service to our residents and our businesses. So Documenting quarterly all of our levels of service will help us to have conversations around investment into assets in terms of what the service delivery is that that asset gives to us. So it, it affects uh, a lot of work that we do because even the work in our operating budget where we have developed service areas and have broken down our budget into those various service areas, all comes down to the level of service that we're providing to our residents and businesses in the county. So we want to develop corporate level of service documents uh, for the entire organization. Okay. Supplemental from Councillor Vandenberg. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, our Okay, hey, general government services, we're spending 9.3 million currently. This is an ask, a yearly, an annual ask of 30 grand to cover off, in this case, for example, a couple of external consultants to provide state of infrastructure report and a round table, round level service report. Um, okay, I, I would almost think that should be done internally. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, that should be a part of the asset management plan. What have we spent on the asset management plan to date that you've been uh, working on? Which, by the way, I will make it very clear that it's, 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 it's needed. It really is. Um, but it's like the IT thing. Unless you ask specific questions about IT, it's just an, another ask. It's just more money to go in the kitty because nobody understands IT. Um, so I, I'm just wondering why you can't, pull out the 30,000 and go internal with it. Um, and these type of reports, are they gonna be an annual thing? Um, is it uh, maybe next year it's two other projects for 30 grand? Um, I guess that's where my head is, is going with this. What have we spent to date? And what, why are we asking for more that we can't already do internally? So in 2021, we, I would say, in terms of external dollars paid, would be around that $30,000. We do have the SDM grant that was approved 
back in 2020 that we just finalized the deliverables for that grant. So we have some external grant pullers that we've tapped into. So that is the external dollar spent um, in 2021. So an asset management program is something that is a continuous um, thing that we work on as an organization. So for 2022, the two initiatives I've mentioned would be done in 2022, and then different work would be identified in the asset management committee for completion in 2023. Part of that mandate for that committee is to identify the areas that we need to improve upon. This $30,000 ask per year is to support the advancement of that work. Currently, we don't have a dedicated asset management position within the organization. So we are tasking uh, those involved with the asset management committee to be doing some of this work off the corner of the desk. And to be frank, there is a lot of learning that we can do as an organization in terms of asset management best practices that by using some professional services help us get those learnings that they can support us to advance that amount. With $30,000, those two initiatives I mentioned, there will still substantially be the work will be done in house with some support from external but it will require a lot of internal resources to complete those two projects because those two projects in and of itself are fairly big pieces of work. So it would be a combination of both. It wouldn't be something that we could just turn over to consult that they would do without our extensive involvement. So prior, if I may, Ms. Klamosko, so prior to our um, committee uh, sorry, our policy and, and our committee asset management was kind of done ad hoc, I would assume. This, this will pull things together and ensure that um, all the assets are looked at um, and the timeframes they should in a way that's appropriate um, in, like, in a more consolidated way. Is that, is that a summary of what, what we're moving towards? Yes, I would say that we're moving towards a more corporate approach to asset management in lieu of departments in isolation and in lieu of assets uh, by them. Okay. in their own silo. Right. That we are looking at things uh, as a committee, setting priorities on our asset management practices as a committee that has that representation from every department in the organization which should lead to less one-off requests and or um, failing assets. I would, I, that would be what I would look for as a KPI on this, both of those pieces. Um, thank you. Any further questions? Just the observation based on the response. Um, so the asset management plan is a tool that helps you predict uh, <coughs> when your assets will be depleted or the optimum time to change them out. and including buildings and people and things with tires. So really the ask here is um, let's recognize 30 grand on a yearly basis uh, to cover off those special uh, requests for information consolidation, plus what we're already doing internally for FTE. That's what I'm hearing. That is correct. Okay. okay. Thank you. Further questions on the asset management program? Good discussion, good clarification. <clears throat> okay, so moving on. So the next new initiative um, that is unfunded is the last link, incorporated petroleum dust depression to country residential subdivisions. So information perhaps will move to the detailed page as this is an item that was not brought forward at the workshop that we had earlier in the month. So there were discussions at the Public Works Committee to bring forward this item to the 2022 work series. So there is a survival uh, from road operations in terms of background on this initiative. 
and they have broken down the initiative into three year priorities. So they have identified that the first year would be $242,471. Year two would be $180,443. And year three would be $160,708. This item was a new initiative presented in the 2021 budget, but it was not funded at that time. Okay, Councillor Lewis. Thank you for clarification. Why are we budgeting the 583,000 for this budget? Or no, it's not, I know it's not funded instead of the 242,000. If I, if I may, we budgeted on the summary document, the 242, but the, I was gonna call it a PPD, the new initiative um, request shows the entire amount so that council is fully aware of what approving year one would then amount to. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And I have a question and I think I have Councillor Vandenberg. Um, when we do a cold mix, and this is about dust, this is dust suppression or cold mix? Just, well, this isn't a calcium overshoot, it is a cold mix, is that correct? Yes, Madam Chair. So one of the issues with cold mix is if you are in a subdivision where you have water and sewer being hauled in and out, cold mix doesn't really have a chance at the number of years that are, that are provide or seen here, I don't think, because um, we know that that creates a, a huge amount of um, wear and tear on the roads. These roads are taken care of on our uh, they're, not a, they're not a private road, so they are, they are looked at like all of our other public roads. Um, so I, at this time, uh, I guess those are all my questions at this time. Go ahead, Councillor Vandenberg. So this initiative is uh, highly visible to our taxpayers. They see what you're doing with this. Um, we set up uh, criteria in which we have uh, traffic counts. We have road usage of X, 250 units a day, blah, blah, blah. Is there an opportunity to look at that roadway surface from a different point of view, make sure the drainage is good, make sure the internal workings of the road are good, and then the topping conversation. And this is addressing the topping conversation. And so, um, so these areas that are, are uh, uh, identified for us by administration satisfy that criteria that we've all talked about and approved. Um, yes to the question on, you know, depending on what, what we don't have in the criteria is how much of the heavy traffic due to back trucks and stuff are typical to this road, which would be good to know in all of this. Um, but further to um, uh, another consideration that's being uh, perhaps not considered is the MG30, the test pilot uh, the, uh, material. Is that what it is, right? MG30? That, that oil-based stuff. That's one of them. Uh, so why, why, if this is going to be kind of uh, cold mixing the road, at that, and that's what the costs are, why aren't we looking at what the MG30 uh, material is? It's a little bit more rubbery, and it does break down, but it does give you the same type. People think it's the same thing. Um, and yes, it does probably need a motor grader more often after it's done, but the cost of it would be really interesting to see. Because this initiative is to is for those people who are traveling that thing every day, 250, <coughs> 300 vehicles, and we're not doing anything to them. So we should probably be looking at some other alternative than the cold mix, just for this conversation and see what that those numbers look like, in my estimation. I'm not sure that that is what we're looking at here. It's it's a, it's a incorporated petroleum dust suppressor is what this is called. Oh, I, I just heard that it was cold mix. I don't think it's actually cold just, just for clarity, it's it's the same thing. Coal mix and incorporate petroleum is the same thing. It's just terminology. It's, it's, it's oh it's, it's whether it's batch it plant or road mix. Um, yeah. 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 Okay. And, all right. Well, all that for nothing. Yeah. <laughs> but but good discussion. Sure. But but just to and I have Councillor Smith, but just to clarify, what what isn't on this chart on page two of four 
is the actual traffic count. Is that correct? Because the preamble says uh, this tra um, a general transportation manual, 30 lot subdivision could generate up to 280 trips a day. Uh, some of the smaller subdivisions here wouldn't meet the 250 threshold. So, this, so yes, we do have a marker for the number of traffic, the, the traffic count, but the chart on here actually doesn't show us what that traffic count is. I, and I understand this is under the line and maybe we want to revisit it later once we get some more information, uh, but that is not included here. Councillor Smith. Again, this is a program. Uh, just Councillor Smith, your microphone is on. This is a program we need to look at. Uh, last year had a look at it. Seems like a good idea. A lot of complaints generated. <coughs> and these are subdivisions that we're allowed to go ahead without asking the developer to finish the road going in. So that falls back on the county to do something about it. Um, I'll just point out that my road, 503, actually does have, um, I think, a 200 meter test strip, as did Sunnybrook. With this material, my road um, has probably four or five fully loaded sewer trucks on it each day, has oil field traffic on it, and it does have 200 meters, which is held up. I think what we need to do is bring together all of the pilot projects that we have, my road, Sunnybrook, uh, anything else that we may have done with uh, just oil on the road and come up with something because we are going to at some point have to jump in and start doing... and repairing some of this. So could we, is this something that could go back to public works fairly quickly to bring in the results of the test test uh, spots that we already have in whatever variety. And how many people know exactly how many test traps we have on the go right now for this? Well, we had three uh, multi test trips. So, so bringing that information, maybe requesting an information from public works on how the three, four, five, six, ten 10 different pilot projects that we have going or working and where best we could put our money. Does it need to be a three year? Can it be a five year to make it more manageable? But maybe it's something that like I, and I'm also looking at your first ones, your um, kilometers, you're probably close to three. You're doing three kilometers or four kilometers in the first year, which is super expensive. So I guess I'd like to see this going, but I'd prefer the chair of public works to bring it back and then let's 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 get our act together on what we want to do yep, going agreed. forward. Councillor Vandenberg, and then I have a comment. And then just one final to that is that these numbers then um, if you if you do a length of road, uh, then there's no requirement for gravel. Right. Have we deducted the cost of, of graveling every three years on this as well? Because that's relevant yep. to this, I think. Um, so that it's going to be an amount less what our cost of graveling would have been. So I think that's more relevant. And there is a consolidated annual cost, but we could break that down more. Maybe that's what it is. Yeah. I don't know. Um, and just uh, my other piece, and I, I support Councillor Smith. I mean, we can, this is below the line. I think you're right. I think it does deserve more uh, attention and conversation um, and would request that if we are going to bring this back to public works where I think it should be uh, the bottom line of the first page says the first year will complete road that appear to be structurally sufficient um, and I would like to have more confidence what I do know <coughs> is that the butterfly cove the south wizard lake road we just rebuilt two years ago but the other ones I'm not sure and what we don't want to do is commit to a road that then needs a significant rebuild or significant ditching or that. So a little bit more information on um, this, the how, how, uh, what shape they're in to begin with. So Councillor Lewis and then Councillor Vandenberg. Did Thank you. you. Just, nope. a, just a comment uh, following up on Councillor Vandenberg's. Uh, we have, I know administration's working on a policy um, for last link so that roads right. like this don't end up happening in front of us again. Um, and I believe that we at Public Works had asked that this come to budget for consideration and, and funding um, to fix these issues that are across the county, not just in Division 1, 2, or 3. Um, so this is something that I, I believe that we need to look at and maybe to Councillor Smith's point of stretching it over four to five years so it's not such a hard hit and, and assessing what the traffic count is right now. and. Um, I think this is something that we need to look at. Uh, Councillor Scobie. I guess 
this number that we're, you know, the 242,000 for year one, that's the initial laydown. Yeah. It's not factoring in the three years from now. It has to have a $100,000 rejuvenation, right? So we have to kind of figure that one in. And yeah, I think it's, it's very important that we do a serious road evaluation before mm -hmm. we do that. I've got two miles of Range Road 15 there that yeah. people are screaming at me that yeah. they want their pavement back because yeah. we paved it and the road fell apart in a year. So they are expecting this something to be done with that yet. Yeah. So uh, we do have to you know, look at it. make sure we look from the bottom up yeah. on this. And it should go back to public works and probably be uh, you know, looked at. And it maybe isn't going to make this year. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and again, right. And it's not budgeted for this year. And, and maybe as Councillor Smith suggested, it's one road a year, not three. And we look at it that way. But I think there's some unknowns we don't know um, and look forward to the policy. So thank you, um, Ms. Weiss. So I just wanted to double check that I have everything straight. This is going to go back to Public Works Committee. They're going to look at how much heavy traffic is there. What about MG30? Do we have a traffic count for each individual road? Have we deducted the cost of gravel? Uh, the comment about appearing to be structurally sufficient and over spreading the cost from four to five years. Yep, that would be good. <coughs> and anything else they think we need. Okay, deal. <laughs> Councillor, Councillor Vandenberg. Just further to a uh, point that uh, Ray raised. Um, good point, uh, but I wouldn't minimize this. Uh, I mean, these three select. There's only two hundred forty thousand dollars. And yes, these three that are selected this year, they need to make the cut. There has, they have to make uh, that which we've established uh, at the bare minimum so that we enhance mm -hmm. our investment. Um, but I don't think that we just say, let's just do one and don't know where it's 242,000 is yep. not a lot of money. If all three make the cut and raised road should be considered in this as well, then let's do it. Um, is, is the conversation I want to have in public works. And just to clarify, uh, Range Road 15 isn't a last link. It is a road oh. that failed. And so it's... So then it's that becomes different parts of this budget. It is, right. It, it needs to be considered, but it is not a last link, and nor would it fit in that policy. It's it's under failed road that needs to be fixed. It's the falling apart yeah. piece that kind of ties together. Is slowing down? They are slow. Yes. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Good discussion. Thank you for the good note taking, Ms. Weiss, and we will move on. I guess Ms. one other thing yep. I should maybe mention on is to look at uh, not only our test sections that we did, but that kilometer we did up at Genesee on the gravel haul road with the oil incorporated, it'll be coming four years. Mm. Uh, that And that's that heavy traffic That's a heavy on haul it. road. And to make sure that we uh, get a summary on how that, it's held up very well. A little bit of minor repair and uh, it's got better every yeah. year so uh kind of a history and a uh the story on that one would be very good to put into this when we're looking yeah. at yeah you know doing some of these and looking at the outcomes it's sort of one of those it's done well what did we learn from why right. did it do well what did we learn and what can we apply somewhere else is it an apply to all or yeah, yeah. good point okay thank you for that um, moving on, I believe to we make major and capital project tab 11, tab, tab 11. 11. Okay. And whenever you're ready. Okay. So the first document under tab 11 is the overall summary of major and cap project plan. So we have total success of just over 28 million. Of the major project plan is 1.5 million, and the capital project plan is 26.8 million dollars. So the box underneath the expenditures just breaks down various funding sources used to fund those expenditures. Okay. Any questions on that sheet? 1.5 in major project and 26.8 equaling 28.3 funding to follow. Councillor Vandenberg? Uh, just on the uh, uh, the funding, Western Economic Diversification Grant, how, how, how long are we going to be able to count on that, that money? Is that sort of a, um, is that an ongoing uh, 
source of, of uh, funding? Mr. Cole. No, that project so, it is project specific to the Misty Spine Road. Yeah. Yeah. So, so just to add to that, uh, all Western diversification projects are project specific. Uh, so we have to apply each time. Um, so far for some of the smaller projects, there is indications that there's money there. Um, plus there is still a larger capital fund that we want to try to access going forward as well. So the pool is limited in size. It's just getting your ask in as quickly and as the many smaller times projects. as possible. That's correct. Yep. And that's the strategy that I'm sure you're using. Yep. Grab is what we can. And just a reminder that the West, this, this $11 million is part of our coal transition fund. It is just being delivered through Western Economic Development. Okay. No other hands up. So the next couple of pages just have some various graphs for council's information, just in terms of allocation of taxes to the two plans. So you um, just have broken it down into some different uh, pie charts yep. just demonstrates the information in different ways. Are there any questions on any of the graphs? Pie graphs or bar graphs? I am seeing none, Ms. Klamosko. Okay. We can move to, I guess, the major project plan behind the bin. Yes. Okay. So the next item is the major project plan. <coughs> So this plan was reviewed, a draft form of it at council workshop previously. So the first project on the list is the Kavanaugh land reclamation. So that's a continuation of work that needs to go on for five years for landfill. Any questions on that project? Okay, and again, we have discussed these, and uh, but any further questions on Kavanaugh landfill reclamation? I'm seeing no hands, Ms. Klamosko. Okay. So the next project is the Miski Water Facility Fence Improvement. So this project, there was a question asked at the workshop by council in terms of distance or the area that will be fenced. So there, there will be approximately 100 meters that will be fenced. And we did uh, the comment around to ensure that the structure of the fence is photo on the project shows that the fence um, is laid over that we will make sure that construction takes into any consideration and concerns with the previous design. Okay, so 100 meters and a better fence than the one that fell over. That's correct. Okay. Ms. Klamosko, just to clarify, was it 100 meters or 800 meters? 100 meters. I'm old. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So the next project was an update to growth projection. So this is a project within planning and development to update population and employment forecasts, land supply inventory, and growth management um, approach. Okay, any questions? We did discuss that. That's part of uh, we know EMRB is going through a growth read, um, a growth plan update. We can feed the numbers into there. It helps determine how we're going to move forward. Councillor Smith, microphone on, please. Just wondering this uh, update to the growth projections. Will that be done in, co in uh, collaboration with the city of Leduc to the, through the mayor to the manager? Uh, no, it won't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Great, great question, but no. Well, All right, then we're on to the next, uh, go ahead, strategic plan. So we have a project to complete our 2022 to 2026 Leduc County strategic plan. Thank you. And I just would like to uh, recognize administration for referencing Council strategic plan, not only in the county business plan, but in individual business plans. I mean, it really has become that guide to move forward. So greatly appreciated. It was not a document that sat on the, of the shelf. It was something that actually provided vision and direction for the county. So thank you for that. Any questions on the strategic planning process money? Ms. Weiss? Can I just, I just wanted to, one of the things that we didn't talk about is your project profile documents were all updated in your, you should have a little binder that was given to you. 
So if there was any details that you were looking for, they're in the little binder that was, and this was an updated since our discussion. That's correct. Okay. So did you take out pages and replace them then? Because I had made some notes and I'm going, where did I put those notes? We Just did. Old huh? Yes, we did. <laughs> okay. So going forward, you would appreciate Hopefully, if we did not take them out? Yeah, because I'm okay. sitting at the kitchen table on Sunday going, I made notes in this that I forget a binder. Okay. Perfect. No problem. We'll make sure that we do that for you going forward. She didn't count so bad. It was just a good dream. <laughs> okay. So the next project on the list is MP005. So it is a contribution to uh, Beaumont Port Recreation Center. So this is payment four of five for 500000 Okay. And that's turned out to be a great asset for not only the county and all our residents, so good money invested. I'm seeing no questions. Okay, the next one I, I, is... do, have a, I do have a question. I apologize, Ms. Camasco. Microphone, please. So based on this next year, we should uh, end our commitment to the Beaumont Sports Centre. Just a question going forward, because I see in planning years down the road, I believe when we've gone to the 10, we have a pretty major hit at the Calmar arena and warbird arena i didn't believe it's about a million dollars we have no other further commitments to beaumont at this time other than cost share is that correct and if we can't answer that right now i know miss weiss would get back to us so the question is after this beaumont uh, money is gone aside from cost share do we have any capital shared commitments nothing at this point we have nothing okay Can okay I just follow through uh, as i did sit on a committee i don't know if it's still there and again, just again, uh, thank you for the longer range planning from five years to 10 years. Uh, but I did notice within there, you had a Calmar uh, rink renovation and Bo I believe Warburg's in. Uh, will we be freezing um, any further contributions then to Beaumont? I know they have a lot of uh, projects in the hopper right now with a lot of requirements. Uh, how can we gracefully not continue to fund one community's overbuild. Mr. Coleman? Um, Madam Mayor, members of council, I mean, th that's uh, obviously something council that we'll see. come forward with uh, over time. Uh, at the end of the day, it's council's decision how it wants to fund these major capital projects. Again, it speaks to this idea around the 10 year plan of, of starting to understand other communities' visions and then allowing us to have some time ahead, lots of time ahead actually, to start to position these over a 10 year period and at least get some initial understanding of whether council's even supportive of some of these things long-term. And then we can signal back to those municipalities what we're prepared to do and what we're not prepared to do, knowing that we have council's vision behind us uh, for sure. Absolutely. Thank you for taking those plans now from five to 10 years. There's a lot of explanations there, but, and I agree if I could through the chair that we do have a lot of pressures on us to build. And I, I believe Calmar is in the queue now. I believe Warburg is in the queue. We need to get through those projects. That's a, probably a substantial hit, much the same as that, but we do. I know Beaumont sitting on that committee has asked for millions of dollars uh, in renovations. And again, we need to watch our money a little bit closer, I believe, than just continuing to build because we need it right now. It's nice to have. So that does clarify and also kind of sets out our commitment to Calmar and to the yep. Warburg uh, projects. We also know that, uh, and I have Council Blazer, we also know that as inflation continues to increase, um, probably the scope of some of these projects and or some of the projects might disappear. I mean, it is getting very expensive to build. Well, Councillor Belazer. I was just going to mention the Warburg one, which Rick brought up, and I thank you for that. We got to know that that, that is depending on We're provincial right. grant money. Yeah. So that is not going to go ahead. And, and I've made that very clear to the previous mayor of Warburg that he thought maybe the county would kick in the province's share. And I said, that's not going to happen. But until the province comes through, this this could sit on the table for many years if uh, they don't get their grant funding. Okay. As are most of those recreation cost shares and recreation builds. <clears throat> okay, MP007, Ms. Klamasco, back to you. So we have um, the recreation cost share capital contributions of 350000 oh, for partner municipalities. So that's an ongoing project every year. Okay. Okay. Moving ahead. Next project is a transit needs assessment feasibility study. 
an application for a grant has been submitted. So the $75,000 project, we've applied for a grant for $50,000 to support that initiative. And I think this is a, a, the right time to be doing it. We know that uh, the county chose not to uh, participate in the regional transit authority, which, pardon the pun, isn't going anywhere just yet. But this will give us time to create our own transit for where we need it. And I think that's this is just good planning ahead of time. Thank you. Councillor uh, Vandenberg. Just on this, um, the feasibility assessment, I mean, at the end of the day, it needs to be very open-minded as a result of the report. I mean, if it, for example, going on your own is, is one way of looking at it, perhaps, um, but looking at um, external partnership and resources yeah. in and around us cannot be ignored as well. Um, I just want to throw that in there. And again, because we will be driving this, it allows us to look at public um, private partnerships, perhaps, or it just really opens up our options. Councillor Lewis. Thank you. Will this be going ahead whether or not we get the grant? Uh, that's something we haven't contemplated. Uh, we're, we're fairly confident we're getting the grant. If we don't, then I, I think this warrants it. And so we've come back to council and asked for funding source. Councillor Smith. Definitely, I think the time has come. Uh, again, I would like to see the grant money, but I think we probably can't wait. And it's something that I would be receptive uh, sitting on council to get that snapshot of what we need to do probably sooner than later within our transit needs. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Weiss. Uh, to give a little bit of comfort as far as that goes, we did a couple of years ago set aside some money specifically for transit. So we do have some reserve dollars available specifically for transit. Okay. Thank you. Good to know. Once again, good planning. Uh, moving ahead to 008. So we have the Recreation and Parks Master Plan. There were some questions asked in terms of the master plan, um, looking at the existing plan that referred to as the Vistas Community Parks and Open Spaces Strategy. So uh, Mr. Honesty provided some feedback just to say that that specific plan just dealt with the VISTAs area specifically, and that this new plan would look to the county and the whole to create that overarching master document and would incorporate uh, feedback from all the various plans from the region and also with some planning documents into the development of that master plan for recreation. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor Vandenberg. Okay, so and I and I asked those questions. Um, I guess number one, when is this going to be completed? It doesn't clearly show me that. What is the intended completion? Um, it, uh, Q4, Q4 yeah. 2022, good. And then secondly, I still would like to have a status on you've got a 2006 uh, recreation and uh, I don't know what it's called. It was done in 2006 because it's on my binder in my binder sitting on my my shelf. Um, and then the one that was done in 2019, which does have some, um, some KPIs, some outcome uh, points, but we've never talked about them. And so I really want to know what the status, what, what did we achieve with the money spent back on those two projects before we start spending another $100,000? Um, and I get that it's tying a lot of this information together, but what happened with those other ones? that we've allocated money to be spent on. We got them, here is what the plan was, here are the outcomes, but we've never heard about them. So I still would like to have that uh, in some sort of, a, we don't have an FCSS slash recreation Parks and recreation committee. Uh, committee meeting, which we probably should, um, but we need to have, for me, we need to have that session if yeah. all were agree. And if not a committee, and this is, you know, back to our county manager, maybe a quarterly update from Parks and Rec and FCSS that could come to a, a governance and priorities meeting. That just keeps us in the loop. Just like you said, I'm not sure that we need a full-blown committee, but we'll leave it to administration to solve that in the best way they think. But I agree, we, we need to have more of that information coming back to council. I, I do have a question. And again, um, when I look at, and it's, it's great, I've, 
what it says in the binder specific needs of this plan coordinated facility planning to meet residents needs and this links back to councillor smith's question about you know beaumont might want this and calmar might want this will this plan help to put that in perspective that we'll actually be working with those municipalities uh, to better understand our role in their planning as well mr coleman uh, Madam Chair, Members of Council, it, it should, uh, okay. in, and I say that in a way that I, I, my experience here in the five years I've been here is I'm, at times I'm not sure we drive our own recreation yeah. agenda. So I, I think that. these other communities do. Um, the one piece around a recreation master plan is it should be what are our needs Perfect. and how do we satisfy them? And it might be through partnerships. It might be through structures of our own. Um, we need to understand that because Oftentimes here, it feels like we're driven by the city of Leduc, we're driven yeah. by the city of Beaumont, we're driven by the Warburgs, the Thorsby, the Calmars. And, and that's great to have those partnerships, but what is this council's vision of yeah. recreation? Whether it's facilities or trails or passive opportunities, what does that look like? Um, the old recreation master plan doesn't really focus on that, in my humble opinion. It talks about other things, but... Thank you. That that's actually a, a great summary of what I hope this document brings. What does Leduc, what do Leduc County residents need? Not how do we support other recreation facilities that our residents might use. Absolutely great. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, microphone. Sorry. Sorry, we're live. I'm, I'm trying to teach I'm performing you. today. Um, will we be hiring an outside consultant then to answer some of these Hello. questions we may have not answered in house? Yeah, I think there's there's dollars to to do that. That's the intent. It's the, the balance in my experience with consultants the last number of years is we do the work and they take the credit. Yeah. Um, but but it's work that is focused work, and so the idea is to use a consultant to whatever degree we need to. But a lot of this work needs to be done in house as well. And so it's, we've taken a blended approach here. It's not unlike the conversation around the asset management. We could have spent a quarter of a million or half a million dollars on asset management consultants and, and brought full-blown plans to your table, but it's not a made in Leduc County solution. I think some of our best work as we've seen through the MDP and other documents we've moved forward on is when we're engaged and we do the lion's share of the work, um, it's documents that mean something to us and they're living documents, uh, not unlike our strategic plan. Why is it a living, breathing document? Because it was your blood, sweat, and tears that put it together. So not unlike the strategic plan, we're going to bring in a consultant to work with us. But a lot of the work behind the scenes is our work. It's, it's having someone that's front and center for them. They're guiding us and pushing us uh, to get the desired outputs and outcomes that council needs on these documents. That's great. Which, Councillor Lewis? Just a comment. I'm just happy to see that there's community consultation that's going to happen within this plan. Yeah. And your comment actually links into the next project, which was done mostly in house. So go ahead, uh, Ms. Klamasco, 009. Okay, so the next project is the Central Nisku Local Area Redevelopment Plan. So this is a $10,000 ask to initially implementation of completion of this plan at the cost. <clears throat> Questions on that? Um, I mean, anyone? <laughs> Council <Kelsey Vandenberg? laughs> Um, I thought we approved the full budget on this. Um, and this is supposed to be completed Q2 of 2022. Why do we need an extra 10 grand uh, on this, which I thought we already approved? So there were budget dollars approved in 2021 for um, 2021 costs were incurred. This final piece would be for the public hearing as a cost and to the adoption of the plan, which is final year cost. As we would to budget, we've, we've gone away from budgeting this multi-year planning project in one year, but rather budgeting in the year that the expenses are going to be incurred. So does it still meet within that anticipated one lump, but okay. you're saying you're spreading it out. I get that. Does it, is this a, an over, this is an additional ask or is this within what was originally intended? No, this is an additional ask of $10,000. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you. <clears throat> On to uh, zero ten. So we have Gross Hamlet Tilly's capacity assessment. So we there was a question asked on this project at the workshop. So the question that was asked, um, so there was a uh, schedule a workshop with council regarding the tie-in of additional lines to the lagoon. So a workshop has been scheduled for January 25th. A second question was, how does the growth capacity relate to the lagoon renewal? <laughs> the answer is, it doesn't. The lagoon renewals are required to maintain the existing assets. The growth capacity study is to determine if additional lagoon capacity is required to maximize the available water supply and what is the cost to complete the potential lagoon expansion project. The lagoon renewals are to keep existing lagoon in working order. It does not take both into consideration. Okay, thank you for that clarification. And again, this was a um, discussion that came out of uh, how do we accommodate growth in the county and do we have that room around our hamlets? Any questions on it? Yeah. Councilor Vandenberg? So I know that the work has been done around Kavanaugh because it's been pushed through. We're at a point now where we're trying to determine uh, for those uh, particular residents that want to tie into the lagoon, uh, what that cost <coughs> is going to be. Uh, so that done, um, as far as I'm concerned, is this then um, a, an assessment as to what do we, how can we expand that for the future? Um, in the case of Kavanaugh, certainly for Rolly View, I know that that's uh, an important piece. And the same comments around uh, New Sarepta. I thought we already knew what we've got. I thought we committed to cleaning. So is this money for, this is what we have, Here's, we need to take a look at what we can do and what it'll cost us to do to expand for the future. So going to the project profile document. Yes. So it, the first point, it says the completed analysis of the Hamlet's role with you, Kavanaugh, New Srepta, utility servicing limitation to determine the available municipal utility capacity to serve this unit and existing development. So this is information that we don't have that utilities want to, to gather. Okay, but you do have develop some of this. So I, I would assume we do have partial, I know we have partial at least for Sarepta and I'm hearing Kavanaugh. I'm just gonna turn to Mr. Coleman. So we where we have it, of course we won't redo it, but we wanna build on it. I don't know. That's correct, we wanna build on it. This comes from our conversations yeah. we had around, had around scrap <laughs> and, and whether we should be focusing development in those urban growth areas. And so it is part of what Councillor Vandenberg has indicated. How do we understand and know what we need for requirements for that growth uh, beyond what's existing um, that's supported there now and the growth we can currently uh, handle versus what new growth and, and expansion would look like. So if we have the work, we're not gonna duplicate it. Yeah. it it's to give council a, a more fulsome uh, understanding of where we can go with our growth hamlets. And I think it's important that it's 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 the same. Um, when we do look at it, we are looking at apples to apples and not a study done with some metrics and then a new study done with different metrics, which this will allow us to do. Okay, thank you. Moving on. So the next project is the NISCU and East Vistas Utilities Capacity Assessment. So again, there was a question asked on this project as well. So the first question was, how is commission's growth capacity related to this project? So the ACR WC's policy is that if capacity is required by a member, it is their responsibility to provide it. Uh, Capital Region of the Water Services Commission bylaw states that the commission shall make commercially reasonable to provide capacity within the system. So, however, it is the municipality's responsibility to provide reasonable five-year projections to the commission, both the sewer and the water commission, to allow the commission to plan accordingly. This study would provide the current state of the capacity for water and wastewater renewable systems. It would be a reference. Uh, it would reference the need to be reserved for existing vacant and redeveloped 
in the image, so it identifies when and how capacity will be required within our own system, as well as from both mission systems. This information could also be used in the refinement of current offsite levies for water and sewer. The Commission's growth capacity and analysis relates to distribution, where this project relates specifically to the end users within this queue and this fitness. The second question that was asked was Do we not already have this information? And the information administration is no, do not have that information. Thank you, Ms. Klamasco. And I do see that it is a recommendation out of one of our own reports, the Economic Development and Growth Management Study. So as we continue to re-envision NISCU and grow North NISCU and the growth that's happening in the VISTAs, we want to make sure that we're able to service. Um, and again, that's just good business sense uh, from the NISCU perspective. Any other questions? I'm seeing none. Thank you for those those responses and on to MP012 is the building life cycle maintenance, uh, NISCU district or fire station and NISCU public workshop. So there was a question asked at workshop on that project as well around um, is the makeup air unit currently failing? So the unit is not currently failing but it is at the end of its life. So expected useful life for this type of unit is 30 years, and the current unit is 29 years old. So this project is to be proactive, uh, a proactive measure in lieu of being reactive should this old piece of equipment fail. It's easier to replace it before it breaks down and you're trying to do supply chain and get her in. Go ahead, Councilor Manabert. This isn't big dollars, I get that. But if you expect that it's at the end of its lifetime, then you have, you, you invest in the parts and the equipment to, and put it on the shelf and you allow it to continue to perform until it does send you a strong signal that it's time to change out. You may get one to five years more out of it, which then, then gives you a one to five year extension in performance to, to just simply change it out when it's working at its presumably 100% capacity, um, I, I don't know. But once again, this is not high dollars, but if that's the thing about the asset management uh, I'm a little bit concerned about is if it says it's gonna last five years, we're gonna change it out regardless, I'm thinking we're gonna throw away money um, because what we should be doing is being fully prepared that in five years it's going to uh, fail. But if it extends, we've then leveraged uh, further savings is, is, is my thought around this and, and other systems like yeah. this. So just, and I'd like to just build on Councillor Vandenberg's comment. So the next um, three items have to do with buildings. As we move towards this asset management um, consolidation, again, these would be coming I would assume in a different way, we would have that long term, as Councillor Vandenberg said, maybe we wouldn't have three in one year then. Uh, we'd have a better understanding. Is that part of what we want asset management to do? Well, I think that proactively with asset management, uh, we want to establish some good internal processes to be evaluating condition of various assets because. You don't want to make massive decisions necessarily just based on the age of an asset. If it's filling the level of service that you want that asset to support, then there can be deferral for um, on the replacement of that specific asset. I think for certain ones, um, you know, just given that we have this older piece of equipment that is near its end of life. It's it's trying to be proactive here. Yep. But with asset management practices, we would be looking at condition, prioritizing projects um, throughout all the projects within the county on asset replacements. Yep. Um, so there's just a lot of, um, we have a lot of different asset classes and it's coming down to um, how you do the right point in time for the replacements because you don't 
want to get to the point where our approaches let everything fail. Correct. And then replace it because then you have an impact to the services that you can provide. So it, it's trying to find that right balance. And the answer is going to be different for different right. types of assets dependent on the risk that it creates for the organization. Correct. Councillor Smith. I think we made a kind of a commitment to asset management, which means you have to, I guess some of us may even do it at our own homes and our own farms. And that allows you not to have failing. So right now, I think we've embraced asset management, which maybe we don't want to do. We can always just do catastrophic failure and fix stuff at that point. So I'm not sure if we're in operations today worrying about asset management. Uh, if we want to switch to catastrophic replacement, yeah. then let's make that decision here. Let's not take on the tube of caulking. Uh, if we're going to, and we all know what asset management means, go to your vehicle, changing the oil, putting tires on, and we could all drive our tires until they all blow up and then change them at that point. Then we know the miles that we get off of them, but most of them will run 80,000. So let's either embrace asset management, which means maintaining what you have, or let's go to catastrophic failure and replace stuff when it, when it fails. So again, I just think we're in operations when we're nitpicking at a hundred grand to fix up our buildings, which is pretty cheap. Yeah. Councillor Vandenberg? So this is a fundamental conversation. Um, yes, we could argue that you're going into the operational side, but it's the bigger picture. The question is designed, my question was for the bigger picture. If there is at least conversation around the, the determination that we need to plan for this because it will uh, get changed out. I agree. We don't wait till total failure to change something out, but there's always depending on, and as Renee right. said, depends on yep. the item. Yep. There's always indicators. Um, what I want to ensure we're having is that conversation um, that just because it's on the checklist to change out, we're going to have a conversation. Is it ready to change out? That's all I care about. I have yep. a well pump yep. sitting ready to go at home. And I know that the well pump that I've had in there is six years old. I'm not going to change it out until I see signs and symptoms that it's time to change up. I've invested in it. But if I had, uh, in my uh, farm, if I had the replacement, if I had a schedule of, of changing out everything um, at a certain time by what uh, the MFG has suggested, that means I got a lot of extra money sitting around. Okay. I still need to have those conversations because I'm trying to extend my dollar as best I can. And all I care about is in the asset management that it's just not, oh, it, just, it happens to check this timeline checkbox, time to change it out. Let's have a conversation around it. Is it? That's all I'm getting to and on this. I believe our county manager would like to respond. Yeah, th th those, I mean, that's a great, great question. And, and those are questions we're having. Um, you know, we really try to look at risk and is it really needed and necessary? Um, you know, we're getting better at our assessment processes. That's, that's part of what this ongoing journey is about with asset management is it, it's no longer good enough around here that it's hit 150,000 kilometers and we're getting rid of it. It, it is about what is the risk? Uh, what is the tool for? Um, is that a reasonable condition assessment. All these things are being talked about, and, and it is there's tension in in the, that committee around that, which is a good, healthy thing. Um, at the end of the day, the, the buck stops with me, yep. and and unfortunately, you hired a CAO that's really cheap, <laughs> um, and so they are tension type situations yep. where we're there's there's lots of pulling to get new, and there's lots of tugging to just yep. live with it one more year. So we are having those conversations. Councilor Scobie? I guess what you know catches my eye in this uh, report, uh, you know, we're, we want to repair sealant because we've got uh, drywall damage already from leakage. So obviously that is a, a priority one uh, job to get done. But then when they say that uh, the air, uh, rooftop makeup air unit is in fair condition with only one year of 30 left in its life cycle. I'm kind of agreeing with uh, Councillor Brandenburg that uh, you know, there's no reason that, that may have 10 years left in it. Uh, if it's still in fair condition, if they're telling me it's poor condition and rattling and shaking up on the roof, well, you know, it's getting there, but if it's still rating as fair condition, well, I, I think there 
it's up, you know, I, I would hate to see it get chucked out because it's, somebody said it was only good for 30 years. Can we flag that uh, for some more discussion uh, as we move through? Go ahead, Council. Um, sorry, Ms. Weiss. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, I'll, add, I'll add it to the adjustment summary document so that it comes up kind of each morning. Perfect. Thank you. Um, on to um, 013, which is the county center. Go ahead, Ms. Klamosko. So this next project is the building life cycle maintenance for the services building in the county center, which are buildings that are co-owned with Black Gold School Division. So these are some projects for some maintenance work that is posture between the two organizations. And the Black Gold School has agreed to the 50-50 cost share? Yes, these are projects that are discussed. We have an administrative group that meets and that these projects were agreed to by both organizations. Okay, any questions on these? Uh, Councillor uh, Vandenberg, Councillor Belazer. Um, just a question on the uh, sign, uh, and I watched, I looked at it, and there is a little bit of hole. When you change it out, can you maybe, is there another color to go with? Um, that's all. He'd like to be on the color committee. Uh, on to Councillor Belazer. Yeah, the 50 50 cost share. Now, are they cost sharing on the 66950 or is that ours and theirs is above? Go ahead, Ms. Weiss. Oh, sorry. So the cost of the project is what you see in the PPD. So that, that is our that's half. Total. That's our half. That's our half. That's our half. Okay. Thank you. So the next project on the list is facility security enhancements for Thorsby Public Workshop, Thorsby District Fire Station. So there were questions at workshop for both projects. So uh, the question was a couple of years ago, there were security concerns relating to some of the buildings in the county. Were these the buildings of concern? Do we have a concern in Thorsby? So the answer to that is anytime we have a lot of facility, it is a concern for us to address. We have strategically upgrading our security through all of our facilities in the fourth shop and fire station are the next ones to uh, be completed. So we had created a multi-year plan to do these security enhancements. So this is uh, now we're reaching the replacements or putting in security of the facility. There's also the question around providing an asset loss amount in the past three years. So we have had losses over the past three years consisting of uh, trucks, trailer, skid steer, and tractor, and also some jaws of life. So the loss was around $225,000. Okay, any further questions? I would just make a comment on that. Uh, you know, I, I think the, the security thing is, is it's become more important. Uh, we'll look at last weekend in Warburg where yes, they uh, the the broke bank. into the MCON building, took a loader and attempted a bank robber with it. Uh, you know, uh, I think we should have something. That, you know, our shop is out in the country. Yeah. Uh, if without something there for security uh, to let somebody know that there's something happening, they go in there and take a loader or a grader or whatever they seem fit, the snow plow and decide to go and yep. uh, make a new entrance into a bank or whatever, going after uh, ATM machines and whatnot. Uh, I think it's important that we have these things secured. Uh, Thank you. Councilor Vandenberg? I don't disagree. Um, it was important to know what what we've had uh, had in the past and for its losses and of course that which renee talked about was a number of places that's fine the problem with video is it doesn't do a whole lot for you it's the triggering component of a, of a security system um, that is much more meaningful than uh, the the afterwards of the video because nine times out of ten you can't ascertain anything from the video anyway we can't afford high 4K, 8K resolution on video cameras. And even if we do, um, it doesn't do a whole lot. It's the triggering component that is probably the best feature uh, of a security system, regardless if it has video or not. So 
that's only my that's my comment on that thank you just a couple of comments that you know, with these security enhancements we're hoping if they are a deterrent to make us less attractive um, for people to hit but there would be operational processes put in place for those alarm triggers so we would have a response um, right away and it wouldn't be a delay for example currently a lack of a security system something can occur on saturday we may not uncover it until Monday morning whereas now we would have immediate notification of yeah. something happening out of the shop so. okay thank you for that additional comment um mp015 so we have the next project are some enhancements to the jubilee park they use improvement so we have a forty thousand dollar project here that will be funded by the user fees uh, that were collected at jubilee park okay the okay. next project we have is agenda management system um, so again to look at a software system that we can implement to enhance our legislative processes account okay the next one is the automatic vehicle location system for twenty five thousand. again it's to do a review and do an implementation uh councillor smith microphone please uh twenty five thousand dollars i see that kind of as a waste i could always pick up my phone and phone somebody in their vehicle and find out where it is probably for a lot less again why it just seems this has come up year after year we funded some sort of things we funded on base off base i'm just wondering is it twenty five thousand dollars we can put into something else and do we i guess through the chair to the county manager do we really need it uh, there's there's aspects of AVL that are that are that are nice to have and and we use uh, uh, from a risk management standpoint, knowing where equipment has been, the work they've done, when they've done it. Um, that that's nice elements to have. It's not on all our equipment, um, so this is looking at what equipment it should be on. Uh, do we have it on the right pieces? Obviously, it's on our graders. We use we use that tool a fair bit. And, and then the other piece is what can you do with limited AVL around even theft. Uh, security. So when we get a new piece of equipment, you put in a simple little ABL tab uh, that just can be a locator. It's not tracking data or anything. Else, so it's a simple cost. So it's it's using this money to come up with a program that's reasonable across all assets that we have. Uh, currently, lots of our, our assets don't have ABL. Uh, some are on dis different systems. Um, so it, it's, it's here to stay. It, it's a tool we need um if you ask me are we using it to its maximum potential i would say currently not um but we do use it lots in the road ops area and it's looking at where do we expand it appropriately and, and are we getting the right data the right tools the right information so uh, but it is here to stay so a number of years ago i would say two terms ago we did approve a, a purchase of an avl system this will build on that system this is not a new system correct? that's correct okay at least using it more efficiently. Thank you. Um, on to 018. So we have the implementation of enterprise content management solution for $60,000. Some questions came out of workshop in terms of the IT strategic plan. So we was emailed to council last week with the PowerPoint presentation that was provided to council when the IT strategic plan was developed, as well as the IT strat plan in its entirety. And then there was a question about how much spending has been covered to date on the IT strat plan. So project spending at this point has been 150,000 within project dollars and operating dollars, 60,000 dollars. Okay, thank you for responding to those questions. Anything further on this item? Councillor Vandenberg? Um, so if we spend the additional 60, thank you, uh, thousand, are we, are you satisfied with the implementation of the enterprise content management solution? 
So we're just in the midst of finalizing um, the process in terms of the RFP evaluation and then the creation of if a suitable vendor is found and we would forward on signing an agreement with that vendor. So at this point, we're still in the planning phases, but my expectation is we have built fairly substantial and extensive list of project requirements for this new software and that we have the project team to ensure that we deliver on the needs that we have for this new system. Okay, so I'm hearing no, we're going to spend some more, um, which is fine. And I apologize, I did not have time to go through that email. It was pretty busy last week. Um, and I guess my other thought is, it would be nice to have in your project costs, a cost to date count, uh, uh, call. So I don't have to keep asking these questions. Um, so, I mean, this is going to be, and I'll check the email and, and review it. And I don't know if it's, if you're, if the, if the overall plan was 400,000 to put this in over the next blah, blah, blah years, we're all good. But uh, I guess I'm just, just don't know where we're sitting in that whole, um, the whole plan in terms of implementation. Okay, so within the, the plan, you know, it laid out a framework um, for various initiatives over a period of time. So we have been implementing the various projects um, that align with that strategic plan, but there will always be um, the various operational considerations, different things that arise that may change priorities from that plan that was developed. Um, by that external consultant at that time. So it's a guiding document. I would say that we will follow everything to the exact letter of that plan as the priorities can shift and change, but it is a great guiding document for us for these foundational pieces of IT. And, and every project within that plan will come forward as a budget request specifically to deliver on that item. Estimates were provided um, in the IT strap plan when it was originally laid out, but we will always bring forward specific projects that are specific to roll out a component, and it's not an ongoing project. They're all standalone projects. Okay, thank you for that. <clears throat> So that is the end. Any final comments on major and capital project plans? Ms. Klamosko? No comments. Thank you. Councillor Vandenberg has his hand up. Councillor Vandenberg? I intended to wait till the end for questions, but we jumped in as we went. So two questions, Kavanaugh landfill reclamation. We were gonna spend X dollars to get that reclaimed. Is there any ROI opportunity with that after? Is there anything? be able to recover some of that. I mean, is it just going to sit there forever, ever, and ever? Um, is there any opportunity for thinking that we could do something uh, with that is my first question. Second question is, it's the fence. Um, $30,000 for 100 meters, if I got that correct, is $300 per meter for a fence. Can we double check that number? Because that just seems like a lot. Okay, of money. we're getting a nod on checking the number. Yep, and you're at it. Second, your first question was, what could we possibly use the reclaimed nuisance ground for? I say a solar farm. That, that's, Madam Chair, that's not an unreasonable uh, idea, actually. It's, um, it, you would never use it for residential, or nope. you shouldn't. Um, there might be some industrial or non-residential use for sure. Uh, maybe a solar farm would be a logical sort of uh, piece potentially. I'm not sure. I, I, I mean, in terms of FDEV, to be able to have, have it out there that this is available for yep. a P3 opportunity or something to uh, RLA. <coughs> it's not this one, just this one either. Yep. There's one out in your area. Um, I mean, what do you do with it after it's reclaimed? You've got your certificate and whatnot. Yep. Some degree of ROI would be good thinking. Okay. Um, we have 20 minutes left. Uh, council, we could go down because everyone is here. I'm not going to suggest 
we look at starting um, the capital property uh, MCPC, but maybe we could look at the corporate plans and chunk away at a couple of those, or we could break early for lunch. What is the what is the desire of council? Are you prepared to go ahead if we started with corporate plan or not? Um, administration will be quite pleased if you decided to adjourn <laughs> for lunch. <laughs> If we went for lunch? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay, early lunch or move ahead, guys. I'm looking for. I'm hearing lunch twice, three times. Okay, we will recess until one o'clock. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>